It is now time for member statements. The member from Nipissing. Thank you, uh, Speaker. As this legislature knows by now, I take every opportunity to promote Northern Ontario. Today, I want to talk about an exciting addition to the agriculture sector. Yes, Speaker, farming is alive and well in Northern Ontario. In fact, 50 per cent of Ontario's canola and 40 per cent of Ontario's Excuse me, are grown in northern Ontario. Oats. <clears throat> Forty percent of Ontario's oats are grown in northern Ontario. I want to introduce you to farmnorth.com, a new and exciting website. It's a comprehensive resource for anyone interested in entering the agricultural sector. It's his daughter who designed it. Oh, I know that. Well, are you going to give me a chance? Are you cutting into my time now? Uh, <laughs> entering the agricultural sector in Northern Ontario. And as the member stepped on me, uh, uh, Speaker, it was designed by our very own uh, John Van Toff's daughter. The website provides... Well, then, I won't ask him why he hasn't introduced this yet, then. How's that? It's a comprehensive resource for anyone interested in entering the agricultural sector in Northern Ontario. The website provides profiles on 10 northern districts, including information such as number and types of farms, farm capital value, and plant hardiness zone information. The site also provides information on relevant organizations, a directory of agribusiness suppliers, research information, and important community contacts to help successfully enter the agricultural sector in the North. Speaker, I'd like to thank all of the organizations involved in the project for putting together such a comprehensive and easily accessible resource to promote northern agriculture. Farmnorth.com. For the, for the sake of the jocularity, I allowed it to go a little over, so we'll, we'll move it. Now, yes, member statements, the member from to Windsor, Tecumseh. Good afternoon, Speaker. First, a shout-out to Toronto author Andre Alexis. He is this year's winner of the Scotiabank Giller Prize. The Giller's connection to Windsor, Tecumseh was amazing this year, Speaker. I have an outstanding independent bookstore and publishing house in my writing. Biblioasis had three books on the Giller's long list of 12, and Speaker Biblioasis had two on the short list of five. Samuel Archibald's story collection, Arvita, and Anna Cana Schofield's novel, Martin John. The other one on the long list was Russell Smith's Confidence, which was also shortlisted for the Writers' Trust Award. It is unheard of that a small independent publishing house would have so many books selected in a juried competition as among Canada's best of the year. And one of their poetry books, Robin Sarah's My Shoes Are Killing Me, won the Governor General's Award for Poetry. So congratulations to Dan Wells and his team at Biblioasis, the small publishing house that roared this year. And Speaker Windsor's Poet Laureate, Marty Gervais, hosted another literary evening at Willisted Manor last week. It was standing room only as other poet laureates and remarkable poets from across the province shared stories and read from their collections. Speaker, John B. Lee from Brantford was there, as was Mississauga's new poet laureate, Anna Yin, Roger Nash from Sudbury, Terry Burns from Owen Sound, and Debbie Oakenhill from Sarnia. Poetry is alive and well, Speaker, further proof that we should have a provincial poet laureate here in Ontario. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Trinity Spadina. Uh, I rise today to recognize and celebrate Centennial, sorry, Central Technical School's 100th anniversary. Central Tech is one of Toronto's oldest and largest high schools that I'm proud to have in the writing of Trinity Spadina. On October 16th, I had the opportunity to attend an assembly at, at Central Tech to celebrate this important mi milestone. Over 2,000 former students attend the anniversary celebrations, which included a fundraisers to support programs at the school. Central Tech is an important history. This, this school was built in 1915 to meet the growing needs of Toronto's employer for skilled tradespeople. Central Tech teaches academic alongside a variety of technical skills. Programs throughout its history include nursing, blacksmithing, optometry and aerospace program. This anniversary reminds us of the continuing importance of trades in Ontario. 
graduates from the trades program, like those in uh, Central Tech, form an essential part of our high school um, workforce. This is important that we encourage youth to enter the trades as both a vital and a fulfilling career. Mr. Speaker, I am proud of the impressive history of Central Tech. I rise today to congratulate Central Tech on their centennial anniversary and the contribution the alumni, the staff, the students have made to the writing of Tunis Spadina and the province of Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Further member statements? The member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, as you know, November is long month, and that during this month there are many events uh, occurring across the province that uh, are highlighting the importance of breathing. Today, I was at Women's College Hospital with the Ontario Lung Association celebrating World COPD Day. I had the chance to test my breath strength by taking a spirometry test and learn about chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, a lung disease that blocks airflow, making it difficult to breathe. As mentioned, our breathing capacity is tested by spirometry, a simple test used to diagnose asthma and other lung conditions like COPD. It takes only a few minutes but makes a huge difference in the long-term health and well-being of those who struggle to breathe. More than 2.4 million Ontarians, that's one in five, live with a chronic lung disease, be it asthma, lung cancer, or COPD. Lung cancer alone kills more than breast, ovarian, colon, and prostate cancers combined. It's unfortunate that we continue to live in a province where people are still struggling to breathe. Lung disease is the only chronic disease not to have a provincial focus or strategy. It's time to move on an Ontario Lung Health Action Plan. We have a bill here introduced by MPP Catherine McGarry, one that we support, and I call upon the government to bring this bill forward in committee so we can continue it on the process. I would also be remiss if I didn't remind those in the House the importance of making sure we do all that we can to help those who struggle to breathe and breathe with ease. In May, together, we stood in reflection as we passed Ryan's Law, a law aimed at helping kids in Ontario school breathe with ease. Although we celebrate the passing, bill's passing, we're reminded of the terrible loss of life of Ryan Gibbons, whose name is stamped on the bill's pages. He lost his life at school when he could not access his inhaler in time. Ryan's mother, Sandra, stood in this chamber on that day. Her tireless effort to make sure no parent loses a child was evident as we glanced over to see her frozen over us, a presence reminding us we need to do more to help those who struggle to breathe. Be proactive with your lung health because when you can't breathe, nothing else matters. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Other member statements, the member from Timmins, James Bay. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, we have many people that are gathering in Moose Factory today on the passing of uh, Margaret Wabano, otherwise known as Gukum Wabano. Uh, she is the oldest uh, surviving residential school uh, person in the history of Canada. She died, she was 111 years old. Wow. Uh, Margaret, I got to tell you, was quite the character, and my dealings with Margaret over the years uh, have been nothing but great experiences the times that I've seen her. Uh, she had a sense of humor and a sort of sense about life uh, that I think a lot of us can be able to take to heart. Uh, the one thing that she always talked about was the ability that people should develop in order to forgive. Uh, she went, unfortunately, through the residential school uh, experience when she was seven years old at St. Anne's up in Fort Albany. And she never talked about what happened there, but you know that it marked her life forever. And her dad and her mom, in order to deal with it, essentially took the kids and moved into the bush uh, so that the uh, local, uh, uh, the provincial government at the time and the church uh, couldn't get a hold of them. Uh, so they lived in the bush. They stayed there for years until the kids were old enough to come back into the community and not have to be snatched back into a residential school. And through all of that, she kept her sense of humor she learned to forgive and to move on. Uh, she, uh, she was the mother to uh, a number of children, 25 grandchildren, 83 great-grandchildren, and many great-great-great-grandchildren are here today because of both her husband, uh, Mr. Wabano, uh, Raphael, along with herself. I just got to say the, uh, it's a pretty hard day today in Moose Factory uh, because she was a great part of the life of the people that lived in Moose Factory and on the James Bay Coast, and I know they're gathering today in order to say to their goodbyes to somebody uh, that is sorely going to be missed, and we all say from here in this legislature to the family uh, of Mrs. Wabano and friends, our thoughts are with you. We will miss Gukum Wabano because she was just bigger than life, and we are going to miss her. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you for your member statement, the member from Halton.
Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to rise today to speak about a great organization in my riding. The Halton Learning Foundation is a wonderful charity whose members work tirelessly to deliver quality education to students who need a little extra help. The foundation works to limit barriers to learning for needy kids. Mr. Speaker, I've been attending Halton Learning Foundation events for several years now, and I'm always touched by the emotional testimonies I've heard from young people who have benefited from the program. Last week, I attended the Foundation's fundraising gala. The theme for the evening was Imagine the Possibilities. It was a great event. One young woman talked about how the Foundation helped her when she was facing serious challenges in her life. It was touching to hear how the funds provided helped keep her on track. For other students, funds raised can mean groceries when the cupboard is bare, a warm coat for a chilly winter, or support to leave an abusive situation. Mr. Speaker, these are challenging situations for children, and the Halton Learning Foundation offers vital help, guidance, and hope. So far this year, the Halton Learning Foundation has provided $17,000 to young people across the region. Mr. Speaker, for more than a decade, the Halton Learning Foundation has been working closely with the Halton District School Board to assist students who need a helping hand. Just imagine the possibilities. Thank you. Thank you. Further members' statements. The member from Chatham, Ken Hassett. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Last week, Chatham's Coca-Cola facility marked an impressive safety milestone. On November 2nd, the facility reached 1,000 days without a lost time injury. In touring the facility, I noticed posters that said PAWS, and it stands for Protect Yourself with Personal Protective Equipment. Be aware of your surroundings. Always use proper tools and equipment for the job. Stay focused and execute safely. Speaker, Coca-Cola represents a, or rather operates a remanufacturing and make ready facility in Chatham. Employees repair and refurbish equipment such as coolers and vending machines from across Ontario. The facility is continuously operated in Chatham since 1992 and currently employs 49 people in the community. Coca-Cola Refreshments Canada has a stringent safety policy that empowers employees to be safety leaders. Company policies follow international best practices, and safety audits take place monthly in every facility. Tony Caradona is the manager of the facility in Chatham, and his comments on achievement demonstrate the commitment that management employees share to safety. And I quote, Having the proper tools for the employees and having the proper training are the two main things. It definitely is worthwhile investment. Not only from a financial standpoint, it's good for morale, good for employer relations, and good for customer relations. So strong health and safety records, Speaker, don't happen by accident. It takes hard work and engagement from everyone in the facility. So congratulations to everyone at Coca-Cola in China for a significant event. And by the way, together, let's set our next safety goal to be 1,500 days without a lost time injury. I know you can do it. Thank, Thank you. you. Further member statements, the member from Brampton Springdale. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, tomorrow is Children's Grief Awareness Day, and I hope that all members will join me in wearing blue to recognize this day. Before graduating from high school, one in 20 children will experience the loss of a parent, and this statistic doesn't account for the loss of a friend, sibling, or other close relative. These types of losses are devastating for all of us, even as adults. We all understand and recognize the profound impact of grief in our own lives, but children grieve differently than adults. Kids who have lost a loved one may look and behave normally, all while experiencing inner turmoil. And many adults who lost a loved one as a child will still think of that death as a defining moment in their lives. <coughs> Children's Grief Awareness Day and the hard work of organizations like Rainbows for All Children Canada and their partners bring attention to the particular pain children suffer when they lose a loved one. Thank you to all of those organizations for their work. I'll be wearing blue tomorrow in order to honor this important day, and I hope you will join me. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for the member statements. The member from Durham. Thank you, Speaker. The Bowmanville Hospital is a staple of the community in Clarendon, offering quality community health care. The staff work diligently to do their best with the infrastructure and equipment they have at their disposal, and I thank them for the care they take. Tomorrow, I will be attending the launch of a brand new CT scanner. 
one that is leap and bounds ahead of the pharma in quality and technology. The new CT scanner will help reduce the wait time and enhance care in our community. It was installed in Bowmanville and began scanning patients at the end of October and replaces a 12-year-old machine that was slower and had less computing capabilities than most machines today. It is my hope that this will signal further development for hospital in the future, as my constituents constantly remind me of my passion for renewing the Bowmanville Hospital and the key role it plays in, in the communities east of Toronto. Again, I thank the Bowmanville Hospital for the hard work that they do, and I look forward to attending further announcement in the future. Thank you. Call members for the state.